Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and now powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGid.com. That's TireGid.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We all believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for another great episode. Episode number 81. It's great to be back. I appreciate all the fans out there uh, sticking with the podcast in my absence. I hope you can understand that my commitment to the big three and to my team um, is is equally important for the short time that the season runs in the summer um, to being able to have these great conversations with you all. I have all year to have great conversations with you all. I, I only have a 10-week season to plan the big three. And again, as I've said or stated in previous podcasts, my short-lived time in the NBA due to my political awareness, you could say, due to my sacred honor, uh, has left me in, in this sort of uh, spiritual place where I still greatly desire the competition of, of basketball and the big three is as close as I can get without exposing myself to, uh, to uh, the internationalism, let's call it, <laughs> that I would have to be subject to in order to play pro basketball somewhere else in Europe or, or other places like that. Not doing it. Not doing it. I know a lot of guys that do it. More power to them. I'm not. I'm not mad at that. I, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not criticizing that. For me, I don't want to become some metropolitan world traveler to play basketball. And and for that, I'm very grateful to Ice Cube and and the Big Three, and and the fact that I have the ability to play uh, basketball here in America in the summers at a very high level on national television. Uh, and and with uh, great, great players, great, great players, and be around NBA legends. So all that being said, I'm back. I'm back. Week eight is in Detroit this this weekend. We play on Sunday, the first game on CBS. Please tune in and, and support the big three. Our viewership is on the rise. I think we beat out a bunch of other uh, major major uh, sports uh, or media institutions. Um, so our, our ratings are are skyrocketing this season. It's the best basketball that there's been since I've been in the big three. We have a very competitive field of play right now. I think four teams are tied at four and three, us being one of them, and, and three t- three teams are tied at five and two. Uh, so this weekend is, is going to uh, basically decide who goes to the playoffs uh, next weekend. In in Washington D.C. and then on to London for the for the championship the weekend after that. So it's going to be a very very action packed, interesting, competitive uh, day of basketball this coming Sunday. And you can tune in on CBS 1 p.m. Eastern. It's tip off for my game. We play the Triplets, which has a former two time MVP Joe Johnson on their team. Uh, WNBA Hall of Famer Lisa Leslie, as well as a, a, a another uh, incredible guard named Jeremy Pargo and some others as well. So um, look forward to that. Now, I mean, I've been gone so long, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> but um, really, uh, I, I want to start here, if I can, if I can. We are headed towards the most significant chapter in American history. We are, we are fast approaching the most significant chapter in American history. And what we, what we fail to realize is the speed, the momentum, the gravity of the moment before us. Um, I see all the time. I mean, and then, you know, look. If you follow me on Instagram or you follow me on social media, I like to, I, I for me, my personality is to, to have a blend of, of, of uh, historical information to help people with their perspective about these issues that are happening, uh, you know, all around the world. Um, you know, self, self reflection, talking about my own life, my own, my own experiences. Uh, to 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 be an example, or or hopefully be an example to other people, and and similar things they may be going through. 
Um, but also, you know, blend in some sarcasm and comedy. I think that's that's always necessary. So when you hear me talk about jerk offs and things like that, it's not that I'm not serious, but I'm but I'm also not I'm not really condemning people who are jerk offs. I'm, I'm more so just pointing out how strange our society has become. Um, and it it has gotten really weird out there. I mean, not only are people doing weird things, you know, like hanging off the side of a skyscraper and in order to get 15 seconds worth of Instagram, an Instagram video, right? Not, not only on top of whatever adrenaline rush they may be, they may be getting out of the deal. Um, but, but the importance of social media and the lengths people are willing to go to, to get content for social media, the things people say on social media. So social media in general has become probably the biggest example of, of American people and, and free people all around the world being greatly, being masterfully distracted from the more important issues. Even the issues, even the important issues that are talked about on social media have become a distraction from the most important issues. And, and when you talk about most important issues, uh, my spidey sense goes to one, one thing in particular that I've seen over the last couple of weeks while I've been out there on the road, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the sort of explosion of the BRICS from a commercial, a global commercial, cultural narrative standpoint. You know, all everybody, and and now you have to go back in history a little bit and just and just understand that yeah, America has racism in its history. Is it the most prominent issue? No. Is it the issue that we should focus all our energy on right now? No. Are some of the same people who 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 really set the West? on its path when it comes to racism, are they still running the game today for their own benefit? Absolutely. Uh, so much so that the transference of power, the transference of dominance, it would seem has been negotiated with those people and others as well uh, to move to the next, the next chapter of human civilization, which is obviously blatantly, admittedly technological. Again, you talk about a guy like Klaus Schwab who was uh, who is a, a Swiss, uh, you know, international politician for the most part, uh, whose dad was a Swiss engineer that literally built war machines for the Nazis. You know, you know, Klaus and Daddy Daddy Schwab certainly probably had some some eugenics, scientific, uh, race based uh, ideologies floating around the campfire there at the at the house, at the Schwab residence. Uh, and it shows, you know, and, and the narrative around race, like I talked about with Jason Whitlock today on Fearless with Whitlock, if you didn't see it, uh, please go go back and, and check that out. Um, it's not that racism isn't an issue. It's that racism, it's that the, the energy for racism around the campfire, in the town square, in the public square, the energy for the race issue is aimed at all the low hanging fruit. Sometimes the low hanging fruit isn't even ripe. It, it, it's not even it's not even real fruit. It's wood nickels, as they would say, as some people would say. My grandfather would say, "Don't take any wood nickels." The low hanging fruit we're going after a lot of times when we're talking about race is insignificant, and it's really a sign of self doubt. It's really a sign of 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 uh, individual self doubt. Right. I don't believe that I could actually challenge the fundamental power of 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 the corruption in the world or the, the corruption of the status quo. I don't believe that individually I have a, a, a position. I have the, the know how I have the wherewithal or the individual fortitude and will to challenge the the, the root of the problem. I can't change the root, so I'm going to displace all of my energy and, and my spiritual intuition of the corruption onto the first thing I can put my hands on, onto the first thing I can reach, the first thing I can touch. And there's something greatly dishonest about that. It's dishonest within us, and it's not just black people, but black people do it a lot. 
But really, it's all of us. And it's on both sides of the aisle. Because what we all really know is that both sides of this political polarization are both working to maintain the, the corrupt status quo. We all know that. We can feel that. And if you get us in the right conversation, in the right room, we will even admit that. If you get us in the right comment under the right post on social media, we will even admit that we know both sides of this political establishment are, are, are purveyors of a corrupt status quo. But then we take their narrative, you know, like, like shark bait. And we, we really have. And, and the racism thing is probably the greatest example, which is the only reason I really talk about race at this point. Because we, we fail, as, as black people, we fail to distinguish between what I would call, um, you know, uh, petty racism from actual systemic racism. <laughs> and there is systemic racism. It just so happens that the systemic racism is in the liberal universities. And all of the teachers that come out, I mean, I'll give you an example here in Minneapolis. And look, I'm not speaking to all teachers. I'm not speaking to the majority of teachers. I'm speaking about a situation that I have firsthand knowledge of that happened right here in the state of Minnesota over the last 12 to 24 months. Minneapolis Public Schools gets about a billion dollars a year for funding. And the teachers went on strike in Minneapolis. They went on strike. They said they needed more money. They needed more money, and, and that's why the students were failing. And us black people in Minneapolis, we actually sided with the teachers, culturally, for the most part. We sided with the teachers and said that they should get more money and that their getting more money is a representation of money spent on us for education. And that's not the case. Not only does the money that gets budgeted, not only is the money that get budgeted not a representation of the system's care for us. The fact that these liberal white women who make up the wide body of, of, of teachers in the Minneapolis public schools, um, the, 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 the inference that in order to teach young black kids out of the education gap that exists for Minneapolis public schools versus the rest of schools in Minnesota, just, just so you understand just how real this systemic thing is, um, Minnesota's public school system on a national uh, scale ranks amongst the top 10. Minneapolis public schools and black students in Minneapolis rank dead last or close to the bottom of the pack when it comes to proficiency in reading and other basic skills. That's how huge the education gap is in a state where the public education is by and large really, really good. And you ask yourself, well, how, did, how does this happen? Well, I mean, I look at the policymakers and the politics and, and see them as a reflection of the education. And there's no, there is no way that you can distinguish a difference between the Democrats' hold on Minneapolis and the curriculums and the lack of success for black students. I don't understand how we, how, how, who are we, why are we lying to ourselves? Who are we fooling? We're just fooling us. And I hear all the time, you know, people say, or teachers say, it's not just the teacher's fault. What about at home? And then you get your conservative, your conservative, your Fox News conservatives running and say, yeah, 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 that's right. The black dads aren't in the home. That's why the students don't have success. And I just call bullshit on the whole thing on the whole narrative from both sides of the table. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. No, you know, and again, the, the liberal white woman goes, well, we don't have the buy-in or the support at home. No, that's not why you can't teach young black kids. That's not why you're having trouble reaching young black kids. The reason you're having trouble is because the Marxist university you came from spent more time indoctrinating you educators with Marxist ideology that you could then bring to your community of black uh, students. Um, they're spending more time on that than they are teaching you actual social skills on how to reach youth 
to how to reach adolescents, how to how to uh, assist the human psychology that may be dealing with trauma or or behavioral issues or whatever the case may be. You're not being taught how to do that. You're not being taught how to deal with your own psychological and behavioral, your own your own mental health, your own cognitive issues, which is why a lot of these liberal white women are suffering from mental health conditions. And that's not me saying it as a as some type of, you know, uh, uh, insult. This is a self-reported phenomenon amongst liberal white women of a certain age, 35 and under. And I would venture to guess if you really took a census from 35 to 50, you would find a bunch of uh, white women that are on psychiatric medication who may not be reporting that they suffer from mental illness uh, because they in their head believe that their psychiatric medication is is helping them deal with uh, or cope with or manage uh, said mental health issues, which is a lie. And, you know, <laughs> again, why am I even talking about this and, and, and how does this relate to the BRICS? Well, it's funny how the global affects the local. It's funny how the global affects the local. It's funny how the local affects the global. We have to get hip to that right now. We have to get wise to that because it, it, it just is the case. The global affects the local. The local affects the global. And we're going to move into a chapter in human history where the implications of that are far, far and away beyond what they ever were in the past. So how do these connect the dots? How does the, how does the, edifice of the liberal white woman and her stronghold on American politics and even more disturbingly the cultural identity of black communities in America, how does that connect to the international economic alliance between Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, you might ask? Well, the entire BRICS initiative is based on an anti-colonial narrative. Whether you want to admit it, whether they want to admit it or not, whether America wants to admit it or not, whether the, the, the European Union wants to admit it or not, or, the, or whoever, I don't care what they say. I can hear what, I, I don't care what they, what they will admit, I should say. I can hear what they're saying. And when I'm seeing African leaders when I see Vladimir Putin forgive the $29 billion of debt from African countries that Russia held or other little political moves like that, I see the game. And I told you guys from the very, very beginning of this podcast, I don't trust, I don't know Vladimir Putin. I don't trust him. Shouldn't trust him. Can't trust him. He's KGB. He's a spy. His secrets have secrets. Now. At some point, he may come to a crossroads where God has a divine hand on his journey. And we must leave that possibility open for everybody because it is possible for everybody, no matter how bad or sinful somebody has been. God can have, can use a person. Vladimir Putin's not exempt from that. Joe Biden's not exempt from that. Donald Trump's not exempt from that. I'm not exempt from that. You're not exempt from that. So whoever you are out there, don't be mistaken that your actions can supersede God's plan if he so chooses, because that's blasphemous. That's, that's a, a lack of metaphysical understanding. So I don't know who, I don't know who you know, Vladimir Putin is in the end. I think all of the leaders around the world are going to have an enhanced um, that is going to enhance what they, you know, what, what, what's possible for them as leaders, what, 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 what they may impact, what they may influence, what their decisions may ultimately lay out in, in the grand scheme of things. But I'll tell you this, I don't trust Vladimir Putin right now today, but it, 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 mostly because I know who he is. I get it. He's on every, he's on all the, all, he's on all sides and no sides. And now we've gotten into a war. We've gotten into a war with Vladimir Putin in Russia through Ukraine. And my question isn't about Vladimir Putin and his, and his motivation. My question is about ours. 
it would seem to me that our leaders walked us into a war on purpose. Now, I know there's all these theories out there. You got the Ukraine and the secret bio labs and you got the corruption between uh, Joe Biden and the Ukrainians and you got, you know, all of this speculation. All I see is us being drugged into a war, another war that is now, now fueling a conversation a much overdue, a long overdue conversation about the implications of military industrial complex, about foreign policy, about foreign affairs, about the use of the intelligence community or other like agencies on the global stage. And many people now are going to point to America's recent history and, and, and further back history of, of military aggression. Of, 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 of moral inconsistency within military context. And we do have that in our past. And then they're going to chain that all the way back to slavery and say, these imperialists, these imperialists are your enemy. They've been predatory. They've been predatory economically. And, you know, the, the hard thing to try and, the hard thing to try and grasp for people is that all of their all of their criticisms are true? Yeah, America has been been uh, immoral and inconsistent and hi- hypocritical in our military aggression. Yeah, America has been predatory in our economic, uh, you know, in in the way we've proceeded economically uh, when it comes to other countries. Yeah, America does have a history of drugs, piracy, and slavery, and that was a business model. However, that does not mean that this brick, BRICS alliance is something that we should choose. And that's the narrative they're trying to run. Right now, the war is from within. Right now, America's leaders, America's intellectual elites that have already conceded that America is defeated, that this experiment is over, that America is dying, that the American way is nothing more than white supremacy, which is a lie that they're telling you in order to justify selling you down the river to the highest bidder. Those people want you to denounce your citizenship of your own volition, of your own free will. Much easier than going door to door with a gun and taking your rights. Much easier to create a cashless society. Much easier to get you to put a microchip in your brain or Neuralink. Much easier to get you in an EV vehicle that doesn't use gas, that's always hooked up to a computer so they know your every move. Much easier to get you to have an Apple card where every one of your transactions is now viewable by the federal government. Much easier for you to give up your rights than for them to march door to door at, and, and, and take them from you at gunpoint. That's what your leaders want to do now. That's what your leaders intend to do now. We've been pulled into a war as a precursor, as a precursor to justify the fall of America. That's all this is. That's all that, that, that that's all that's being done here. We were the aggressor here. And it's all true. Again, it's all true. The question is, what should the end result be? What should our choice be as the American people? Can see that our leaders can see that we were so lazy, can see that we were so busy, that we were so passive, that we were so uninformed or brainwashed that we allowed people to represent us right into the fall of our very existence, our very our very uh, identity as a nation, our very power and, and, and overall status or, or actual health as a nation. Are we supposed to concede that? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. We're, we, we know better than you do. We know better than you. America is nothing. America is dying. America has failed. If you believe it, then all of a sudden the BRICS flourishes. Central bank digital currency, 
And you guys think it's a game, yet Whole Foods and Panera say they're going to a palm print cashless society by the end of the by the end of the year. Whole Foods and Panera bread, in order to eat healthy, relatively healthy, you gotta go cashless, and you guys don't see the game. Now we're now we're creating now we're gonna create a global database of handprints and fingerprints for your local grocery stores. It's bad enough that the cops have your fingerprints. You know how easy it is to duplicate a fingerprint? Do you know how easy it is to duplicate and plant a fingerprint? I mean, have you ever said, I mean, do you guys think that the movie, you think that the, you, you know, they say that life, imi- you know, art imitates life or, you know, life imitates, no, art imitates, they say that, you know, life imitates art. No, art imitates life. You think that you think that a lot of this stuff that they're showing you in movies and TV series and all these things come out of nowhere? No, they go and they hire consultants to to inform them or to help guide them on how to make these content, these these productions as realistic as possible given this the whatever whatever, you know, field it is. You know, if it's basketball, they'll hire a basketball consultant to come and tell them how to choreograph the basketball scenes. If it's a movie about the cartels, they'll go find ex-drug dealers or cartels to tell them how the drug business works or the drug world or the underworld. If it's with high-level technological uh, computer, te- they'll go hire somebody who's on the cutting edge of technology and and or, or espionage or whatever the case is and tell them how to do it. And people are happy to do it. They're happy to do it. Why? They've been told it's okay to do it because you're too fucking stupid to do anything about it. Because you're too fucking worried about the use of the F word. <laughs> that's that's the that, that's the axe you want to grind. That's the hill you want to die on, right? That's the battle you you're invested in. That's that's where you're that's the fight you want to have. I can't listen. Anybody using the F word, fuck off. I'm gonna keep using the F word because this is about telling the truth. This isn't about this isn't about appeasing your fears and insecurity and, and overall cowardice, weakness. This is about the truth. The difference between me and many other leaders is I don't want a thousand, a thousand cucks. I don't want a thousand pussies. I don't want a thousand people that are following just because it's a big number. Give me 10 pipe hitters. Respectfully. Now, if I can turn some people who are pussies, cucks, or cowards into pipe hitters, I will gladly do so. I will happily, happily help you make that jump from being a cuck, a pussy, or a coward to being a pipe hitter, but not at the expense of what it means to actually be a pipe hitter. I'm not willing to expand the definition of being a pipe hitter to suit your weaknesses. No, you have to make the climb. You have to make the tough climb to becoming a pipe hitter if you want to be a pipe hitter. And I believe in you. I believe in you. That's what what I what 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 I should also say. Is I believe in you. You can do it. You can do it. But when you fall short, it will be marked as falling short. And part of falling short by my criteria is when you're so intellectualized, when you're so, you know, a uh, posh a bourgeois sort of sort of lukewarm Christianity that your your Christian identity souls upon your not using profanity. I just know you're a pussy. I know you're a pussy. You know you're gonna let you're gonna let Satanists mock Christ, but then you'll 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 turn the you you'll turn turn away from a Donald Trump because he said grab him by the pussy and you don't agree with that. Give me a break. Give me a break. You're a coward. You don't want the status quo to change. You like the high. You like the convenience. Convenience has become the enemy of freedom. Cashless society. The convenience is now enemy number one to freedom. They don't need to come door to door with a gun. They're going to get you the old fashioned way. We're going to make it convenient for you. We're going to make it convenient for you to give up your rights. We're going to make it convenient for you to renounce your citizenship. We're going to make it convenient for you to go to a global identity versus a national or local identity. 
Everybody get on board. America had its turn. They didn't do the right thing when they had their turn. So now it's our turn. <laughs> and these African countries are gullible enough to actually think that Russia and China are coming to the rescue, that they're actually fighting anti, they're, they're actually fighting the colonialism of America. It's actually embarrassing to watch. Seriously. It's, I'm actually embarrassed for these African leaders that I see popping up saying this shit. It's, it's, it, I mean, I wish I could teleport there. Stop, stop, and just have a real conversation with some of these people. There's not a chance in hell that China's, that China's involvement with Africa is any way genuine. I'll go a step further. There's not a chance in hell that Russia's involvement with Africa is anything genuine. Russia's more, Russia, Russia's being more strategic, probably more justifiably strategic because they're at war with the entire West. China's is purely economic. And right now, China's actually, I, I, to, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if China's putting Russia up to the whole thing right now. Take it for what you will. I mean, we're in the fog of war now. I don't know who's playing at what. I know we provoked Russia, yeah. But who, who encouraged them to go? I don't know. Who benefits? Who benefits? We see who benefits. China benefits, for sure. You got the Russian army and the American army displaying their capacities for China. When we most certainly are, are, are on a collision course for, for war with China, by all metrics and by all measures of what everybody in, 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 in our uh, political hierarchy is doing. And then you got to think to yourself, they say we're on a collision course with China, but are we really? Uh, depends on who's in office, I guess. But it would seem to me that the people who are currently in office would gladly lay down their swords before the, 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 the throne of Xi Jinping in the Chinese empire. I don't see them, I don't see them fighting that fight. Do you? When push comes to shove, do you see them standing for America's values, America's, America's constitution, America's citizens and her right and the, the rights that are constituted for our citizens in the face of a healthy payoff from the CCP? I don't see that happening. If Donald Trump gets in office, I like the chances more. Just being honest. Maybe they're putting Russia up to it. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. I'm considering these things these days. I'm trying to think through the scenarios. But what I do see with clarity is that the history of racism in America, the history of racism in the West is now being used as a sales pitch to create a coalition of anti-colonial, uh, ec uh, 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 international, economic, anti-colonial narrative. And the crazy thing is, is, you know, let's just, let's just deal with the history as, you know. <laughs> it's one thing to lie to other people. It's another thing to lie to yourself. Was Russia, you know, is, is, is Russia a, a nation that is, that is, uh, you know, without sin, right? Are the Chinese a nation that never took slaves? Of course not. China is one of the oldest slave-taking civilizations in human history. How about South Africa? I mean, come on, give me a break. Brazil? Is, is, is Brazil a, a, a moniker of, of human rights and, and freedom and international relations or, or you, know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, a bastion of, of, of civil rights or civil liberties? Brazil, really? How about India? Got one of the worst caste systems in the in human history. Per capita. Caste system in India is horrible. Now I think President Modi is a nationalist, and I'm and I and I like the nationalist mindset versus the globalist mindset, but India historically has certainly had its fair share of of, of human rights black marks. 
It's just respectfully. America too. I mean, come on. What are we talking about? My problem is why you black folks in America would allow the uniparty, the status quo, the, the, the mainstream media industrial complex and all of its benefactors benefit from your cultural allegiance to new world order. Why? Why, 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 why sell yourself so short on the other side, you know, with the, with the, with, with the, the great patriots of this country, why would you let them tell you that the crime <clears throat> or the, the chaos in the inner cities is, is what's killing the nation? Let's swing the, let's swing the focus around. I know the black bourgeoisie, they're sellouts. And you black people who follow them, either you're selling out or you're just dumb. Let's swing the focus. I've been on the road a lot this summer with the big three. Drove, drove to a couple places. Because to me, I don't want to just fly over the country. I hate to fly, don't get me wrong. I, for, for me, I, I could care less if I, if I ever flew in, in an airplane again. And I'm seeing all these crazy... Crazy situations breaking out with the airports now and just, you know, more so with airlines having difficulty staying on schedule and pilots and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But when I went to New York, I, there was a plane that landed at JFK or was leaving JFK and was on the tarmac for six hours at JFK, six hours. And didn't let the people, they didn't, they didn't, you know, gate, do a gate return. Just sitting out on the tarmac, fixing whatever issue they were fixing or whatever the case may be. And it's not, it's not infrequent that that happens. For me, I just don't want any part of it. I'd rather take my time, get on the road and be there when I get there. Cause Hey, I'm not in a rush. And part of the great downfall of humanity, like I said, the, the enemy of freedom is convenience. Well, the people at that JFK airport on that airplane that day found that out firsthand that quite literally you're stuck on an airplane uh, for six hours when they're probably going to, you know, I don't know, Philly. I don't I mean, I don't know where they were going, but but certainly they could have been well on their way and in control of their own destiny had they decided to drive. Right. Uh, and, and there's a part of it at a spiritual level that I'm very uh, in tune with uh, when it comes to all these issues. So but but. I digress. Um, I've been doing a lot, doing a lot of driving and I'm driving around the country. And, uh, this, this past weekend I came back from, from, uh, Charlotte and I drove to Chicago, did some things in Chicago and, and then came on home to Minneapolis, which is, you know, all in all was 17 hour drive, but you know, it was about 10, 10, 11 hours from Charlotte to Chicago. And then another six on home to Minneapolis. Us people here in Minnesota or the Twin Cities, that Chicago drive is like nothing to us. You got to get outside of six hours for us to even think that it's a big deal. Um, so, you know, not not a terrible drive at all. And, and actually, I, 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 I enjoyed it. I mean, I really enjoy seeing the country. I'm a road guy anyway, despite my, my fear of flying and that whole narrative that, again, was way overblown. I, I've flown this season. I have the whole I flew here season where I've, where I've, you know, flown to many places. I can do it. I just don't like it. And even more so, I really love the road. I love the open road, just on the road and great music and listen to podcasts, just seeing, you know, looking out there and, and into the, the, the countryside and just seeing the country up close. Not what they show me on TV. Not what they show me in pictures and you know, magazines or books or whatever they came. Not what they show me on the news. Actually out there seeing the country for myself. Drove through the great state of Virginia. Gro drove through the great state of West Virginia. Came through Ohio. Drove through the great state of Ohio. Gro drove through the great state of Indiana. Drove through the great state of Wisconsin. And I started to think to myself. Why would you American patriots allow the mainstream media industrial complex to pretend like the downfall of the nation is going to be unruly, chaotic black folks in the inner cities? Huh. 
when the entire global establishment is coming to buy up all your farmland as we speak. So you see, you're selling out two sides of the same, same coin. And, and you, we, we the people, are a reflection of the power the Uniparty has come to hold in this country over all of us. Left, right, black, white, doesn't really matter to me. We, we gave them their power. None of this is out of our control because none of it is without our consent. They are a reflection of us. And I don't care if it's your black folks in the inner city that are going to be the justification for rigged elections, which is what they are, right? At the end of the election, at the end of the day, on election day, any number we need to come in from the deep blue metropolitan areas, we can come up with. Any number we need to come up with. Why? Because all everybody knows black people vote Democrat. Very, very basic, very, very basic scam with huge implications, with huge implications and huge historical narratives baked into it. Yeah, racism, slavery, so on and so forth, no doubt. Yeah, terrible, terrible. But to allow, to allow the history of racism to, uh, 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 to allow the history of racism to be the reason why you, devalue your own citizenship is just patently absurd. It's absurd and really is dishonest because I start to wonder, do you not know that you're devaluing your own citizenship or do you not care because you think there's a bigger payoff than freedom? And I start to, uh, and, and I start to mourn at the idea that many black people in this country believe that there's a bigger payoff. There's a bigger, there's a bigger reward out there there's a bigger price out there to 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 charge the game than freedom itself and it really undermines the entire movement it really undermines the entire movement that purports to be pro-black that talks about this history that they fight for or fight against that has many of these iconic black leaders that fought for freedom and civil rights it really starts to undermine that when you devalue your own citizenship and concede that there's a bigger reward out there other than freedom itself. This is why many black people today shy away from Malcolm, except from any of the clips that they believe they could get likes from, from the other people who devalue their citizenship and, and, and reject the fundamental importance of freedom itself. Because Malcolm X said so eloquently, freedom is something you have to do for yourself. Anytime you ask another man for freedom, you will never be free. The price of freedom is death. Many of you aren't willing to die for your freedom, but many of you aren't even willing to be free. Let's start there. I hate to act like we're, I hate to go to the extreme of, of, of pretending like people need to be willing to sacrifice everything in order to achieve freedom when really we're not even willing to sacrifice the most basic things. The most basic things like a little bit of time and a little bit of energy or a little bit of follow-up or a little bit of, of reading the details and the fine tune, the fine print. And many people out there will say, why are you talking about black people? We all have this problem. Take care of your own community first. Take, clean up your own house first. Clean your own room first. Look in the mirror first. Oh, and we could talk about, and, and, and I said that first to, to preface what I'm going to say about rural America. And, and, and when I watch Fox News and, and Rhino Cuck, Rhino Cuck Hannity and all the other never Trumpers, or the sometimes Trumpers, or the Trumpers when it's convenient, or the Trumpers when, 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 it, when it benefits me, but really never Trumpers. When the never Trumpers run the narrative that the downfall of America are black people and the chaos and violence that spawned out in the inner cities like shoplifting, right? I see all these videos about, about shoplifting. No law and order. The tax isn't constitutional. The tax is a violation of law and order. A 50%, a 40, a 40, 
A 42% federal tax is a, is a violation of law and order. And this is why the Tea Party was great. This is why the other day I, I wrote on my head in Boston, Black Tea Party. People, people got a kick out of that. Jalen Brown was in attendance and I wrote about, you know, on one side I had Black Wall Street, which I think is still, is a very uh, cool and, and, and uh, a very cool, rich symbol of black history, uh, Black Wall Street and, and uh, an actual uh, racist predatory attack on, on a thriving black community. Um, I like that Jalen Brown from the Boston Celtics said, hey, I want to re-kickstart the Black Wall Street Initiative. He's, he, you know, it's one step away. I, I try to say black nationalism is one step away from just nationalism. White nationalism is one step away from just nationalism. Nationalism has been, uh, you know, what do they call it? Has been uh, walled off as a dirty word with a dirty connotation with this sort of, you know, uh, white hatred, Nazi-esque type of, uh, type of rap. But really all it's saying is we want to have a country with borders. We want to have a country and we want to have a country because if you have a country, then you can actually have citizens. If you're, you can be a citizen, if you can be a citizen, you can have rights. If you can't be a citizen, you can't have rights. You can't have rights and you can't be a citizen if you don't have a country with borders. Basic logic. Basic logic. Throw a little Hitler up there, throw a little Nazis up there, throw a few KKK members up there, and all of a sudden you can demonize having a country? And you black people are going for that? Okay, why would you white patriots out there pretend or let Fox News get you riled up about the, the chaos and violence that spawned out in the inner cities? When the number one, the number one way to ensure self-governance by my estimation, is the control of food. The farmers are selling out the country right now as we speak. And if you don't, if you don't stop now, if you don't turn back, if you don't find the courage and sacred honor to plant a flag in the sand and say enough is enough, there won't be a shred of food in this country that is not a part of the global agenda. That's coming fast and furious. The monopolization of food from NWO. You may say this is a conspiracy theory, but hey, you know, when I'm, when I'm in rural Wisconsin and I see the windmills, all I think is, They're coming for our food. Pretty soon, rural America is going to go green. It's going to be solar. It's going to be, you know, whatever. Whatever Cargill and Monsanto and these other, uh, you know, international, uh, multinational conglomerates uh, see fit, who outsource or subsidize smaller local farms. And, and, you know, the smaller local farms say, hey, we can't exist independently. We don't have the resources to compete with the big boys or the big boys poison their crop. And so they get them to bend the knee that way. However, the, however the game shakes out, uh, it, it bothers me to continuously see this, this sort of cultural lie being told between rural Americans and inner city blacks. And that's really what it is. I mean, let's be honest. The representation of the death of America is, is represented in the mainstream media by the chaos and violence of the blacks. Even the liberal mainstream media industrial complex shows you that without saying it. They show, you, they show it to you and they say, it's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault that black people can't pass the fifth grade. It's your fault that black people shoot each other in, you know, in, in the middle of the street for no good reason. It's all your fault. It's all somebody else's fault. It's all always somebody else's fault. It's never our fault. It's never my fault. And I get it. There's blame to go around. Don't get me wrong. There's blame to go around. It's not wrong to identify fault. It's not wrong to look at the details of what's transpired and properly identify who's to blame, what level of culpability one has. The problem I have is the self-deception. 
And even more so, the problem I have is the self-deception in the interest of preserving the status quo so that your life doesn't have to be inconvenienced. And what I really object to is putting this huge, you know, theatrical, philosophical, and moral claim on your perspective, your, your dishonesty, so you can try and justify it to yourself that it's anything more than you wanting to preserve the corrupt status quo for convenience. I mean, if you're really a racist, if you really hate me because I'm black, then hate me because I'm black. Stand on that. Stand on that. I mean, I would, I, I would actually respect that. But when you LARP as a racist so that you can keep black people out of the Republican Party, so the Republican Party can keep serving in the interest of Democrats, it makes me want to slap the fucking taste out of your mouth. And I may, in fact, start slapping the taste out of some of you motherfuckers' mouths. Fancy that. It's an insult. It's an insult to my citizenship. Before it's an insult to me being black, and before it's an insult to me being a man, before it's an, an insult to to um, to me being a father, to before it's an insult to any of those basic identities, it's an insult to my citizenship. And because it's an insult to my citizenship, it's an insult to my God who has granted me inalienable rights. The Republican Party is, is split right down the middle. And the globalists and the racists are with the Democrats. And we have to have the courage to walk away from them. If we have the courage to walk away, if we have the courage to throw the globalists and the racists out of this party, we will create the room for people who aren't even in a party. We will create the room from, for defectors who, from the Democrats. And there are many over there. There are many people who are disaffected with the Democrats who can't just find, who, 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 who just can't find it in them to come over to the Republican side, to the conservative movement, because every, every, every 10, out of every 10 conservatives, there's one guy who will say, with a full throat, I agree with Margaret Sanger. Poor black people shouldn't have babies. If we don't find a way to put this petty difference aside once and for all, our enemies will devour us. See, see, because in China, they don't have this issue. In China, the Han Chinese are the top dog and yeah they're very prejudiced or you know you could say a form of racist towards people who are not Han Chinese but for the most part everybody accepts the hierarchy the cultural hierarchy there in China they don't have this problem and everybody in China with the exception of the Lao Beijing everybody in China has pretty much conceded to the authoritarian and dictatorial power of Xi Jinping and the CCP insofar as they're left to their own devices. And in that, they're making a grave mistake as well because a tyrant really has, there, there is no, you cannot satisfy the appetite of a tyrant. History tells us that tyrants are not easy. The appetite of a tyrant is not easy to satisfy. So they're making a huge mistake with that. Um, one second. And what I'm saying to you guys is if we can't get past this, we are in a war. Look, right now we are in an economic and biological war with China. And that's not a conspiracy theory. And it's not even really talking about the pandemic, although I do believe that that COVID-19 is justifiably described as a bioweapon. And let me tell you why. It certainly could be a bioweapon that was um, collaborated on from people within our own country, right? Bioweapon that was released upon our people by our people in collaboration with their people. I mean, we're in the fog. This is the fog of war. 
We, I mean, don't, don't, don't be fooled. Okay. We got double agents, triple agents, quadruple agents living right here in America. They've been on the payroll for a long, long time for a lot of our enemies, enemies of freedom. I don't even want to give them a national identity at this point. The people who want to have a nation, we know who we are. We know what it means to have a country. We know what it means to have a country with borders. We know what it means to have a national identity. We know the value of it. We know the value of citizenship and we know the value of rights. I don't need to, I don't need to identify people by their national allegiance because I don't know who's actually allegiant. It's hard to tell. I think they'll sort themselves out as we move forward. And one thing that can be said with some surety, with some surety, is that anytime you are in an open conflict with another nation, open meaning that both parties agree that there's a tension, some type of some type of geopolitical tension between the nations. Anytime you have that that situation uh, or a situation like that, where two navies, let's say in the South China Sea, um, have tension, right? are defensive towards one another or have their guns pointed at one another, which we do. You know, we're both out there practicing scenarios to go into war with one another. Anytime two nations have that type of tension against one another and you are working on biological weapons or biological warfare, you are in a biological war. You are in the early stages of a biological war, whether the weapons are used or not. The, 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 the event horizon does not determine, should not determine in a sane and rational mind, the, um, the existence thereof, right? We are at war with Russia. I don't care how people want to frame it. It's a proxy war or, you know, we're not really at war. We're, we're just aiding the Ukraine. We're not at war with China. You know, we're just, you know, trapped in this Thucydides, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're stuck in this Thucydides, Thucydides trap, blah, blah, blah. We're at war with China, biological and economic war with China. We're at war with Russia. That's what it is. We don't have time to play this petty game with race. We don't have the time for the Fox News to show us the young black men who so ignorantly and, and embarrassingly run into the local Gucci store and take hyperinflated, overmarked, o- overpriced goods from some designer store. We don't really have time for that. We don't have time for, you know, your CNNs and your MSNBCs to show us your 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 uh, middle age uh, menopausal white Karen from rural America or suburban America, uh, you know, uh, calling the next young man uh, the N word. We don't really have time for that. Now I know all of you want to act like there's a real emotional investment and attachment to those types of stories, and that's exactly where you've become a cuck to the security and intelligence community. That that knows. Nay, they were, they were constituted. They were created to run these type of psychological operations on you for one sole purpose. Keep people divided and distracted so they cannot rise up against the corruption of the status quo. It's us. It's us. All we have to do is say enough. All we have to do is put the petty aside long enough to say enough And these people will run for the hills. This is why the great Steve Bannon says, when the people figure it out, when the young people in this country figure out out that they've been made serfs of a gig economy, on the on the on the uh, the on the on the conveyor belt of being phased out completely, they're going to throw these these aristocratic uh, political elites out on their asses. Now, he's a bit more optimistic about it than I am because the part that goes unspoken because it's tough to speak about is that the aristocratic elites did one 
thing well, and that's play, that's research and play on the vulnerabilities of the human psychology, which is why me and the NBA really had the falling out that we did. Not about flying or anxiety or antidepressants or Xanax or banned substances or, or flying versus driving or any of that shit. The corporatocracy is openly exploiting the vulnerabilities of the human psychology. And the best example is to keep you distracted while they bend you over a barrel and fuck you with no lube. That's what's going on here. You're getting fucked. Every day you're waking up, you're getting fucked. It's a silent fuck. It's a subtle fuck. Oh, it's, 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 uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's almost an invisible fuck. It's a fuck you never really feel. I mean, you feel it spiritually. The intuition is, you know, you, you have an intuition that something's not right. That's what a lot of these young, and respectfully, as embarrassing and as ignorant as I think it is, as, as much as it pains me to see us, uh, to see young black men express their political frustration by running into a Gucci store and just snatching $700 bags that are marked up anyway. They don't really have a $700 value. I mean, I know you can resell them for $700, but when it comes to the, the raw materials, uh, it, it, it has no value. I mean, that tells you, I mean, imagine how deep the rabbit hole goes when you think about inflation and you think about how superficial the society has become that you can mark the price up on a bag based on the logo that's placed on it, not even necessarily the materials that are used to make it. And that's what black people have become accustomed to, which is why when we express, express political frustration, we think running into the Louis Vuitton store and just snatching grabbing is, is uh, you know, is, is meaningful. And as much as I, I, I disagree with that, I understand it. I get it. I get it. Now, you could say some people are just, deba you know, uh, are just uh, debaucherous or, or, or you know, uh, you know, moralist or gutless or have no sacred honor. And there is a huge, that is a huge part of it, no doubt. But really, you know, what, what the, that there's an, there's an intuition. I know it because I felt it myself as a young man growing up in this society, as a young man growing up in a liberal rat maze, as a young man growing up in the, in the, uh, in the bowels of, 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 of the American experiment, American experiments. I felt that sort of rage and, and frustration and animus at one point in my life. And I realized that what the system was providing for me to, uh, to use as an outlet for that animus was still a part of the maze. <laughs> and when you figure that out, when you embrace that, when you swallow that pill, then you can really start to go to work on, on formula, re resetting your mind. Not great, not the great reset like like Klaus, like a uh, Nazi Klaus and his daddy Klaus, the Swiss, the Swiss Nazis. Not that type of reset. I mean a genuine, healthy, organic reset of your worldview. And in that that reset of my worldview, I was able to then start to create the building blocks of first understanding the truth and then how to apply the truth in a healthy way, in a meaningful way. But understand out there, white, white conservatives, when you see those black kids running in, when you see those black kids throw the rule of law to the wind, they're doing what they, they are wrestling with the reality of what America has become. I tell Jason all the time, or I've said it on the show multiple times, when your government steals, everybody, when your government steals, everybody's stealing. Well, I mean, the, the, the receipt, the tab on the government's come due, and they've been found super corrupt, and the spirit of the people follows. Now, nobody in their right mind could say that the, the, uh, <laughs> the savagery of young black men in the inner cities is responsible for $32 trillion debt. I know y'all don't like it when I go there. I get it. I get it. I get it. 
I couldn't steal enough Louis Vuitton. Remember, a million dollars stacked up in a hundred dollar bills is the height of a chair. A billion dollars stacked up in one hundred dollar bills is the height of the highest building in, in the world. And a trillion dollars stacked up in one hundred dollar bills would reach the space station. A trillion dollars would reach the space station. Okay. I couldn't steal enough Louis Vuitton bags to equal the amount of money that the American DC elite have stolen from you and your children. And even more importantly, your citizenship, your nation devalued your citizenship. All the black, all the young black men in America couldn't steal enough Louis Vuitton bags or enough of anything from any department store to equal up how much money the DC elite have stolen from you. And that doesn't excuse them. That doesn't, that doesn't absolve them of, of their, uh, of, of, of their wickedness, but it's to try and put into perspective how everybody views the narrative and what we're willing to do in response, because you're being shown that for some reason. Now, I think it's so that you displace all your energy and your opinions onto that instead of the real thievery that's happening right there in your own home. And don't, it's in your home. All you homeowners out there paying property tax, all you farmers out there paying property tax, paying a, a, a fine for the, the USDA and the all of this shit. All of it is the expansion of government. We know what the enemy is. This is supposed to be a nation of shopkeepers fortified by the, by the brilliance of the Second Amendment as a, as a safeguard against economic imperialism. I'll say it again. This is supposed to be a nation of shopkeepers fortified by the Second Amendment to act as a safeguard against economic imperialism. And at each juncture, each pivotal juncture in this nation's recent history, we have conceded the responsibility of being a nation of shopkeepers fortified by the Second Amendment. And we have embraced the rise of economic imperialism. For what? our own convenience. That, my friends, was not, was not the work of black people in this country. We did not concede the American dream and the American Constitution in pursuit of economic imperialism. That was your boomer, white, D.C., uniparty scumbag. Now, sure, they went to a few nonprofits, civil rights activists in the in the neighborhood, and they put them on the payroll, and they got them to to swing the votes Democrat or swing the votes whatever way they needed to to preserve the status quo, um, with the narrative that hey, if the government can't protect you, the KKK will come get you. Isn't that getting a little old? You know, I saw this little fight video in Alabama, and Jason and I talked about it earlier, and uh, I mean. Yeah, part of the part of the system wants to show you that. But part of part of the the community wants to provide that for them. And I'm watching the I'm watching the you know, and Jason put it better than I ever could yesterday and and even today. Um if you watch the commentary, you can see that the system is working just as it should. We really want to believe that there's a race war on the way. And maybe there is if we believe it if we buy into it if we let them sell it to us imagine they take the american dream and they sell you the dream of race war imagine they take from you your citizenship and they give you a beef a beef in a river of blood that'll never run dry imagine they take from you your sovereignty and they give you a manufactured conflict that can never be solved. If you're willing to buy it, then who am I to argue? This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and now powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. We also want to send out a special Thank you to our other sponsors, which I wasn't able to read today, but I want to mention right here now, mybookie.com. Hey, I know all of you don't gamble. The big three this weekend is going to be incredible. If you get a chance, go place a bet, mybookie.com. Use promo code Royce uh, and enjoy 20% off and a few other things, I believe. Promo code Royce, again, mybookie.com, as well as GhostBed. Hey. 
Ghost Bed is awesome, right? Ghost Bed is great. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, you're looking for a new mattress, support companies that support the parallel economy, that support the movement, that support the podcast. If you get a chance, I, I know you don't buy it. People don't buy beds every day. If you're in the business for a new bed or if you're in the market for a new bed, go to ghostbed.com, use promo code Royce, and uh, support the companies that are supporting us. We have some great advertisers right now. We hope that we can help them sell some merchandise and we hope that they stay uh, in support of the podcast so that we can continue to do what we're doing. I think we had a great, great conversation today. I hope you enjoy me, appreciate, maybe not enjoy, but appreciate me challenging, challenging the narrative. Um, I'm happy to be back. I hope you guys uh, are happy to see me. Um, I'm, I want to say thank you to the great Professor Penn for sitting in. Hopefully you subscribe to his channel. If you haven't, please go do that now. And we have a lot of content coming. I mean, I told you before I left that we got the Royce White Show. That's going to be coming soon on Saturday. Oh, I forgot before I go. Wow. How could I ever forget? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stay tuned for, the, for more content. Right, the Royce White Show is coming soon. That that YouTube channel will be Royce White USA. YouTube.com backslash Royce White USA. Saturday night prime time. Saturday evenings, about two hours. Full show, call ins, the whole nine. This is gonna be the more intimate podcast. That's gonna be the big the big show out there on the on the desk with the with the lights and the and the whole deal. So I'm going to have fun with that. I mean, we're going to make that one fully produced. Um, Hebrews is coming. The Last Renaissance with A.J. Barker and myself is coming. Uh, it's going to be inter- an interesting and, and, and content-filled fall, autumn. We're just going to unleash. Because this is the Concord battle. You know, not only, not only 24, but specifically here in Minnesota against the Uniparty, which I hope David Penn has, has uh, alluded to. Uh, Minnesota is going to be uh, a canary in the coal mine for breaking the, the, the stronghold that the Uniparty and the globalists have on purple states all across the country. And I feel it bubbling up now right here in the, in the Republican Party. I saw a great number of patriots. Um, from SD50, I believe, I want to say, if I'm getting that wrong, I'll, I'll figure out which SD they were and get back to you guys. But SD50 led a, a, a sort of a, a sort of inner party mutiny against trying to censor or, or um, obstruct the freedom of speech of delegates in the delegate process. And I was there to watch them do that. They stood up bravely and said, this isn't right. This language isn't right. Um, you're not going to tell us what we can and can't say as delegates in the party. Or designate us as a problem, right? Um, so, um, turn of the tide is on. Turn of the tide is on all across the country, but, but more importantly here in America. I mean, here in Minnesota. And uh, we're going to drop. We're going to drop content after content after content to help you be able to see it, be informed about it, help support it, help get involved. PrecinctStrategy.com. want to send a special thank you to PrecinctStrategy.com. Um, that is the way that we can take the Republican Party back, at least from the rhinos and the globalists and even some of the racists out there, um, which we, we, we have to do. Uh, big battle, but we eat the elephant in chunks, no pun intended, <laughs> um, precinctstrategy.com. Please visit precinctstrategy.com and, and find out how to help take back the Republican Party. But I had to tell you this before I go. I had an episode. I forget which episode it was, which number it was, but, but I, I believe I was in Miami at the time when it happened. And it was one of Professor Penn's episodes that was removed from YouTube for criticizing the WHO. I mean, if this isn't a herald of, the, of, of, of what's to come, I don't know what is. You, you on YouTube, you can no longer criticize the WHO. I mean, who the fuck is the WHO to tell me what I can and can't say? They're beyond reproach. They're beyond criticism. A health organization? A health organization. 
in mo- in modern times in the world today is beyond criticism? I mean, I think we know who we're talking about. Show me the people I show me who I can't criticize and I'll show you show me those I can't criticize and I'll show you the people that mean to own me, that mean to be my masters. There is nobody I can't criticize, which is also another reason why I'm saying it, that we're going to expand and diversify the channels of, of content, the channels and the output of content, because none of us are safe. None of us are safe on YouTube, right? YouTube and big tech fully given over to the new world order. If you can't criticize the WHO, you really can't criticize anybody. Which is strange. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, little bit of news I, I i couldn't believe that that happened i was uh i got a strike on youtube so i guess you know who knows how long this channel will even be up i don't know i don't know if the, if i get another strike today hey please call me crazy it's been fun look out for the royce white show coming soon over on royce white usa but i don't think that's going to happen and even if we go down on youtube the audio platforms at least up until now, have been great in allowing us to to say whatever we want, and it hasn't been taken down. Although I did see uh, a while back that people were having trouble playing the podcast on Apple and and Spotify. I believe um, that issue has been resolved. It was it was something. It, it had something to do with a setting within our own uh, profile on on Podbean, which is what we use to distribute the podcast. Um, so that that was an issue internally. Now, that was a weird one because I'm not quite sure how that certain setting got switched from on to off or from save to publish uh, or whatever it was um, when we hadn't changed that setting. So it kind of did it on its own mysteriously. So that was weird. But I know for a time you guys couldn't play the podcast on the audio platform. And I know a lot of you play the podcast on the audio platform because we can see the numbers. So uh, we're going to continue to do it there. We're on Rumble. Please go to our Rumble. I'm on Band.Video. My Band.Video profile should have all of these backed up. And we're even on BitChute in case case of the worst case scenario. Uh, Right? So... Um, I appreciate your viewership today and in the future. I want to say thank you again for sticking with the podcast through my time in the big three. Make sure that you tune in this weekend, this Sunday for week eight, the last weekend before the playoffs, 1 p.m. Eastern on CBS. Power taking on the triplets and a must win or go home. um, End of the season. uh, Bonanza. Uh, I guess that's a bonanza. I don't know. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a grand finale uh, there in Detroit with eight teams left and seven teams fighting for p- playoff contention, which is the first time that that's happened since I've been a part of the league. Um, I appreciate everybody out there. Again, please, please, if you have not already, subscribe to Professor Pence Podcast. Drop him a thank you note for men in the podcast while I was gone. Stay tuned tomorrow. We will be back tomorrow, maybe with a guest episode, maybe not. We'll see what happens um, this Friday. We may have a guest, we may not. I don't know. I got to go to Detroit uh, to get myself ready for the game a couple of days early. So I think I'm going to be out there on Friday. For those of you that don't know, I pulled my groin. Been very fortunate not to have any serious physical injuries over my career. And uh, fortunate again, I believe, because, you know, a groin tear uh, could certainly be a career altering injury. Uh, It could be a a surgery needing injury uh, and it could certainly uh, slow you down, especially in, in, you know, once you get in your 30s. My body is is responding well to the groin pull. It's still a little sore. Um, but, but nothing that seems like it won't heal on its own. Nothing that seems like it's uh, structural, more soft tissue. So I was fortunate. God giving me a little sign and my body giving me a sign that I need to do a better job with stretching and just making sure that I'm taking care of my body, trying to juggle mixed martial arts and basketball in this, uh, in, in the later years of, of my athletic career. Uh, so I'm taking, taking notice of that. 
And because of that, we'll see if we get a guest episode in this week. But certainly next week, I'm coming back full blast. And when we get to Washington, D.C., ladies and gentlemen, there will be a special announcement. So stay tuned for that. Washington, D.C., playoff game. If we're fortunate enough to make it through this weekend, which I believe we will. I'm confident we will. I'm certainly going to do everything possible to make that happen. We will be in Washington, D.C. for the playoffs two weeks from now. And we have a very, very special announcement in the belly of the beast. Minneapolis is the belly of the beast, but but Washington, D.C. is, is the belly of the beast for real. And uh, we wouldn't waste that opportunity uh, to, to, to make a huge statement. So with that being said, the fight continues. Don't die a jerk off. And as always, Godspeed.